welcome, uh, Ted. And can you tell us, give us a little bit of a story of Henry and your dad? And your dad's name was Tom. And they were in an area called 12 Mile, which was some distance away from Hudson Hope. But the story is amazing. Can you give us a little intro about what Anchaka means? Well, Anchaka is the, I think, the most uh, accepted indigenous name for the Peace River. And I checked quite a few sources and Anchaga seems to come to the top of the list as being the, the most acceptable of the spellings that you'll find. And what does it mean? It means uh, peace, peace or Peace River in the indigenous languages, uh, uh, Cree, uh, Beaver and Sakani. And in the last words, uh, the uh, cha at the end, what does that mean? You, you gave me a, a meaning for that. That means? The suffix G-A-H uh, stands for river in the uh, Sakani and Beaver languages and most likely in the Cree as well. When did your dad and uncle go to uh, the Williston Lake area north of uh, Hudson Hope or south of Hudson Hope, I should say? Well, they traveled from England. Uh, they left in uh, Early in June of 1928, uh, they crossed the Atlantic to Montreal and took the train to uh, Prince George. And in, at Prince George, they purchased supplies and uh, hired a taxi driver to drive them on the Giscom Portage up to Summit Lake. And in those days, the Hudson's Bay Company had a warehouse at uh, Summit Lake, and there they purchased a boat. Uh, which they used to uh, take them uh, uh, north through the lakes and the various rivers, the Crooked River, the Pack River and the Parsnip uh, to what was then uh, Finley Forks. And Finley Forks is where the Finley and the Parsnip uh, used to meet and was the beginning of the Peace River. And the Peace River flowed east from Finley Forks and through the Rocky Mountains. And uh, it was uh, that route they were taking when uh, they met uh, uh, Jim Beatty mm -hmm. and uh, among several other people. And uh, after being there a short while, uh, Jim Beatty talked them into staying in the country. And uh, Jim was aware of a a trap line that was for sale on the south side of the Peace River. And this appealed to my father and also to my uncle. So uh, both my, uh, my uncle uh, evidently agreed to stay in the country while my father uh, traveled to Hudson's Hope where he uh, purchased the, uh, the trap line from the previous holder of the trap line. And that was the beginning of their time in the uh, in the Upper Peace River country. How did they navigate? Like he came from England, he had a classic background. What drove him to such an exotic area in northeast British Columbia? Well, several years before, my father had uh, been in Canada in the uh, uh, Fort Langley area of the Fraser Valley, where he'd been uh, spent some time working on his uh, staying with his his uncle on, who had a chicken farm in uh, Glen Valley near Fort Langley. And after spending two or three years there, he went back home to England. And it was at that point that I guess he talked his older brother into making the trek back across Canada. Because when he was in, uh, had been in Canada first, he'd come across a fellow who uh, would travel in the winter from uh, Walnut Grove, which is near Fort Langley. He would travel up to the Peace Country to trap in the winter, and then he would come back to farm uh, in the summer. And I'm sure my father came across this fellow, Bob Yeomans, that was the man's name. So my father was successful in talking my uncle into making this trek. And my uncle at that time was uh, uh, 
at loose ends, I guess. This was uh, some years after the First World War. And he decided to, to take up this venture with my father. And uh, the book describes in some uh, detail the, what happened and what the goings on during their trek. But, uh, Where is 12 Mile? Because uh, I think that's really important. It's isolated or was isolated, right? Well, in those days, 12 Mile was 12 miles uh, west of the portage which you had to cross to uh, get to Hudson's Hope. And uh, the Beatty Ranch or, and Homestead was lo located at what then was known as 20 Mile and later became known as Gold Bar when, uh, when the post office moved from one of its earlier locations to the uh, 20 Mile Ranch, it became known as the Gold Bar Ranch, which was the home of the Beatties. Mm -hmm. How hard was it to get to 12 Mile? Well, for people who were familiar with travel in the backcountry, I, I should think it wasn't terribly uh, difficult in terms of, of the route they had to travel. It was a known route, but it, uh, the country was, not, wouldn't, was never easily traveled. Some people traveled by horseback and uh, some on foot, but... Uh, uh, they had to carry all their supplies in, I guess. Pretty much, yes. Here's a map. It's on page 96. Can you sort of tell us a little bit about this map? Because it's one of the incredible maps that shows the original homesteads, correct? That's, yes. It shows the, um, the original owners as well. In some cases, the um, the first person or the original person to request the survey and in some cases the person who requested the survey uh, didn't receive the crown grant they would perhaps have sold the property to a, a neighbor or someone else who was interested in owning the property so I've been I made a point of putting both the names in there because otherwise there would be disputes over who was the real first owner of the property and so um, this, if you look at the field books from the lands department, you will find the name of the person who requested the survey. Mm -hmm. But if you do a title search and look for the first person on the title, it won't be the same name as the person uh, who was given the first, received the first mm -hmm. crown grant. So he had some neighbors, is that correct? Your dad and your uncle had neighbors? You had Mr. Beatty is one of the people, Jim Beatty Sr. He was a neighbor, correct? Well, he, he owned the property and he would uh, farm it, mm -hmm. but he lived at 20 Mile. Okay. But he owned, uh, he owned these two, I guess it would be a total of uh, 320 acres, wow. a, ha a half section, yep. these, these two yep. parcels here. You know yeah, how much your dad and your uncle paid for the land originally? Well, it was probably very, very little. Probably just a token because it was all essentially vacant land that nobody else had been interested in up to that point. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the pictures here are really incredible. One of the pictures um, shows, and I think I've marked it here, um, how fertile the land is, correct? Like, there's massive gardens, and this one is shows the fishing. Who, who is that? It's yeah. on page 51. So the viewer, if you buy this book, you can see incredible pictures. That shows, who is that? Is that that's, your uncle or your dad? That, that's my father, Tom Stott, and uh, uh, Tuli Beatty, mm -hmm. uh, the eldest of, the Beattie, of Jim Beatty's children. She told me that that photo was taken on the, on the Clear River, Clearwater River. Mm -hmm and I would have had no idea where it was taken, but she knew when she, yep. when she looked over the photographs. So it's pretty neat that they came as pioneers and they enjoyed the abundance of fish, wildlife, and of course gardening. There's other pictures showing phenomenal gardens um, where the vegetables are just spread right out. So it, that is really amazing. Now what happened to this land at 12 Mile? Can you elucidate a little bit? 
the, it was uh, sold to BC Hydro, correct? Yes, and the appraiser, since <clears throat> since my my uncle and my uh, father weren't active farmers, there were more trappers and uh, well, trapping was more their area, mm -hmm. and uh, they would help uh, Jim Beatty with his farming and so on. But they weren't active farmers themselves, mm -hmm. and so when the uh, BC Hydro appraisers came in to uh, take over the land, they <clears throat> indicated that it was not considered to be uh, arable land in their uh, view because it wasn't being actively farmed. And so they downgraded the, uh, they, they only paid a, a token uh, price for the, for the land because of the fact that it wasn't being actively farmed. Was your dad and uncle mad at the um, amount? Like, that must have been really heartbreaking in a way because that was their soul for so many years. Uh, I think my father was more disappointed than angry about it. Um, by that time, he had left, essentially left the country. And so the land was in his name, but he wasn't actively using it. He, some of the Beatty family, uh, some of Jim Beatty's children were uh, likely farming it, like Bob, uh, Bob Beatty and some of the other members of the Beatty family. Do you, uh, did he ever return to look at it before it was flooded? No, my, my dad had such strong feelings about the, uh, the country that when he f uh, found out that it was being flooded, and uh, was essentially being destroyed. And after all the work that he'd had put into building a, a great uh, homestead house there and that was going to be burnt down, uh, he was so disappointed he just uh, uh, decided he, was, he, he didn't want to go back and see what BC Hydro was doing to the land. Okay, so disappointment is something. Let's go over a couple pictures here. One of the pictures I think that's really uh, incredible is here are some of the, yeah, let's look at that picture. This is on page 42. So when you get this book, viewer, give us a little dra drama about these two pictures. Well, the, the picture on page 42 is quite an interesting mm -hmm. photo. It shows uh, uh, Thule and Gurley Beatty uh, at uh, Charlie Jones' home at the mouth of the uh, Carbon River in about 1928. But it's, uh, I don't know, they look to be really enjoying themselves with, uh, was it a, a goat and a cat? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it just gives you a, sort of a nice feeling looking yeah. at it. The quality of life, how would you describe it for your, your dad and your uncle? Do you think they had a good quality life there? Oh yeah, they were there essentially because, not because they had to be there. I mean, they weren't the normal backcountry people who were s striving to make a living. Mm -hmm. They were there because they enjoyed being there and the, the, the kind of life and learning how to trap and homestead and so on. Uh, it was not a financial necessity for them to be there. Excellent. Unlike mm -hmm. most of the other people who lived in the area. Did your dad talk to you a lot about uh, his experiences there? Anecdotes here and there, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, but they were more, more to do with natural history mm -hmm. rather than, uh, uh, well, I can't recall too many of the details, but I know that natural history was the subject that he was most interested in, the wildlife. Afterwards, when he got home, he painted, he did quite a few watercolor paintings of the scenes that he recalled from his time on the trap line, mostly of uh, the local animals of one sort and another in different situations. And so it's quite incredible. Your dad and your uncle came from a classic English background and suddenly became pioneer fur trappers in the far parts of the Peace River. Is that correct? Well, I would consider the Beatty family more the pioneers. Okay. They were the people who, who taught my uncle and my father wow. how to live in that part of the world, mm -hmm. the trapping and the homesteading and so on. 
and they they help the Beatties. Uh, when Jim Beatty was having trouble with his leg, which eventually had to be amputated, it was uh, my uncle who took uh, Jim Beatty first to Edmonton and then to Prince George, where he eventually uh, had his leg amputated. Have you ever met any of the Beatties? It, the, the Beatties that are now around Hudson Hope, have you ever met any of them? Yes, I, I made a trip to, the, to Hudson's Hope in uh, both 2005 and 2006. I made trips to Hudson's Hope to uh, have the people and the places in my father's collection of old photographs uh, identify uh, who was in the photographs because uh, the, they had very little meaning to me other than with, a f ex with the exception of a few cryptic uh, uh, notes written on the back of them. And uh, I had the, the little old photographs enlarged and took them up and I paid a visit to uh, Tooley Hamilton as she was then. And uh, also I visited with uh, Gurley Powell, the two older sisters of old Jim Beatty. Mm -hmm. And they were very good at uh, identifying all the people in these photographs. And What's your favorite photograph out of the whole book? If you had to pick one or two, what would it be? Um, I would pick uh, these two uh, Christmas photographs because they... Tonight it's on page 76 and 77. Why, why are they so good? Well, they, uh, they show the whole assembly of people gathered together for, the, for Christmas at, at 20 Mile in both uh, 1930 and 1931. And uh, I, I like them not only for themselves, but also because uh, uh, Tooley and Gurley between them were able to identify everybody in the photographs. Wow. Uh, That's an achievement. Well, considering uh, this fellow on the the right-hand side here is is uh, a fellow named Max Sturgeon, who came from Alberta during the Depression to wash gold on the Peace River, and uh, Tooley told me that uh, he was a big help in hauling logs for building the new house at Twenty Mile, mm. and that's a very obscure information that nobody else probably uh, had any knowledge about, at least no other than perhaps Gurley. Yeah, and you have two appendices to your, the book too. Can you describe a little bit about the appendices? Well, there are actually four appendices. Wow. Uh, there's one, an account of the origin of the name Peace River, uh, which uh, I picked off the internet. It's uh, an account of the origin of the name Peace River, an extract from a, an extract from a speech to the Empire Club in Toronto by the Right Reverend E. F. Robbins, 21st of February, 1929. But it was his uh, style of writing that appealed to me. I've read n several other uh, more scientific uh, accounts of how it was done, but I, I found it so interesting, I thought, I got permission from the uh, Empire Club in Toronto to, wow. uh, to include this extract in the book. And then after that, <clears throat> I, I made a list of some recorded indigenous words which translate into peace or peace river, starting with the uh, Anjiga or peace river shown on a map in Alexander Mackenzie's book of 1801. You've done a lot of research. And then there was Anchaga, Cree for Peace, from an article in the Canadian Encyclopedia by David W. Leonard, 2008, and various other uh, uh, sources of and variations on the spelling of the name Anchaga. Yep. And then the other appendices are? Well, that's Appendix A. Yep. Appendix B is, was put in the book uh, at the request of my cousin, uh, the author's daughter. Mm. It's, uh, it was written by my father and it's called A Recollection of Indian Lake by Tom Stott, circa 1951. 
and it oh, wow. it gives his view of uh, of the uh, what is uh, now known as Carbon Lake. Oh wow, that's interesting. Well, Carbon Lake was uh, the official name for the lake, but it was always known locally as Indian Lake. Mm. I made a some sort of an effort to find out if there was an acceptable indigenous name for it, but I was unsuccessful. Uh, I may yet come across uh, well, such a name, excellent. but... Uh, uh, I'm amazed by the pictures. There's wonderful, wonderful fish. And on page 143 is a Tomstadt trapping territory. Excellent. I had this map specially made. Wow, it's at, beautiful. At, at great expense, I yeah. should add. <laughs> yeah, it looks beautiful. It, it's based on a, an old uh, provincial map from the provincial mm -hmm. archives oh, that wow. was originally made in I think 1924 so wow. the features and the names on the original map are were current at the time yep. that the account describes. Uh, Appendix C is about uh, a piece that I put together about a taxi driver that my my dad and my uncle wow. used when That's they incredible. When on their trek when they made a trip to Vancouver, they needed to take a taxi from Prince George to Quinell, and this old uh, taxi driver took them to uh, Quinell, and they found that he had, pre in a previous life, he had been a stagecoach driver, wow. and I did a good deal of research to find out what his name was and uh, his That's background, and I uh, acquired photographs of him and his uh, stagecoach, and. This particular picture shows uh, Al Young freighting on the Caribou Road, driving four teams of horses, pulling three wagons in 1910. And the, the striking point to me was that not only was he driving four teams of horses, he was doing it all single-handedly. Wow, that's as incredible. As you can and if that's on page 145, that's so right. the viewer can do it. And your last one is a biography of your uh, uncle, is that correct? The last one is actually just um, the last photograph that my uncle took of 20 Mile as he was leaving wow. 20 Mile. I show. bet you can still identify it, but it's all underwater, correct? Um, well, the flood line is probably near the top wow. of, of the uh, these hills here. Yep. Uh, and he liked animals because he has a little border collie there. <laughs> yeah, that would have been the the, the beaties dog of the day. Okay, thank you very much for coming in and we have a good show and uh, in a couple words, thank you very much. Do you want to pass on anything to the viewer because you are in the heart of the peace country right here and you're on community TV. Do you like a couple words? Well, I've, I've enjoyed my very brief visit and I've had a chance to visit with several members of the Beatty family and uh, to give them copies of the book and uh, uh, I'm gonna read that this winter it, when, the, when the snow is blowing I'll curl up in my big chair but thank you very much and this book is available at Peace FM just give us a call thank you well wow. thank you Leo yeah.
we start very basic. We do lots of edges and three turns and just basic skills and then work up into the more interesting stuff, I guess the kids would call it, more of the intricate spins and jumps. So we kind of do a bit of everything with them. I'm doing doubles, so that's like a higher jump and then just like spins and footwork and stuff. Yeah. What's the hardest part about those? Um, definitely the double loop. Yeah? Yeah. Because you have to go up on one foot and do two rotations in the air and then land on the same foot. But little darling, they're not there anymore. So just remember me, I'll remember.